Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge and welcome to Eldridge and Company. Today I'm visiting with an old friend, Jim LaRocca. We used to talk a lot about energy and climate change because he was the commissioner of energy in the state government. He's had a long history of active duty kind of public interest stuff. And after that, he became commissioner of transportation. Now he's living, I think, a like slightly different life. And actually, Jim, it's the kind of life I always dreamed about. Uh, I wanted to be in a small town and I had visions that I'd be, I could be a trustee, but I, I personally thought I'd be mayor. <laughs> and my late husband would publish the newspaper. <laughs> so tell me how your life is. Well, you gave it a pretty good description. You and about two members of my family remember that I actually ran for public office once uh, before in 1998 for governor and I was in a crowded field for the Democratic primary and I lost. And people, uh, my party in their wisdom chose someone else. But um, what I've done now three times in Sag Harbor where I live, a small uh, fishing village on the east end of Long Island, is ran three times with no one running against me. Oh, so the that's secret the secret to success is make sure nobody <laughs> runs against you. Right. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that in 98, but uh, so I like how it a do you, lot. You know, local government is so different from being a commissioner, isn't it? In a it state. is and it isn't. Uh, every level of politics, I mean, I started on the Hill, mm -hmm. uh, Washington, then uh, Albany. And, uh, every level of government has politics and all politics tends to be the same. Oh, they uh, definitely have the politics. Yeah. But if you're a local person, you're right in the middle of the people you're governing. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's no hiding. Right. <laughs> do you like that? I do. Um, Dale and I always had a rule that we weren't involved in politics where we lived. And um, I sort of broke the rule here. I got drafted by the mayor uh, to come in uh, the last time I retired from the state. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, and I think he spotted me and uh, knew it was a good time to uh, seduce me, and I did. And sometimes it gets a little busy uh, in terms of all the conflicts that can arise in a small place. But other than that, it's uh, uh, been, for me, very rewarding. I've devoted four years to creating a new park on the waterfront, which we just named for John Steinbeck. Yeah. Um, that's been in the papers a lot. And um, it's given us a little focal point down on the waterfront. So my goals are very <laughs> local. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, I have to say, it's fun. And in it's retirement, good. it's enough. It's enough. <laughs> I told somebody yesterday about the Steinbeck Park because I had read about it when I was looking at what you were doing. And it started because he told me that he saw an ad or a notice or somebody saw a notice that Steinbeck's home is up for sale. This is all just happened in the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, if you have $17.9 million, you can get in the meeting. <laughs> I had this sort of dream scenario that we got the park, it's right on the waterfront. Uh, you know, he did his writing in a gazebo that he built on the point over the water where he lived. Mm -hmm. And I wanted at least to get that for the new park. And we have a community preservation fund on the East End and I've been campaigning to get money from that. Um, I'm flirting with the idea that they'd want to give us $17 million <laughs> to acquire <laughs> the property. But yeah. change.org just notified me that they've gotten 500 petition names yeah. in support of uh, acquiring the house. <laughs> now, our entire budget uh, would fit very comfortably inside the $17 million, So <laughs> we don't have the money. But um, I think there's a lot of interest in in this Preserve identity yeah. and maybe trying to do something with this property. Right. So let's talk about climate change and what's happening in the world. Texas was certainly not better prepared, but it was, they thought they were prepared, right? No, I don't think they gave it a minute's thought. Yeah. They simply, uh, they were a denial state with denial leadership. And right. there's a whole host of people here and all over the world who think the answer to this is to deny it. Well, you know, watch the water rise, watch the storms increase. Um, I think Texas is a good example of doing everything wrong. And uh, the reality is 
um, if you had to put it on a bumper sticker, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And it's getting worse all the time. And that's a shame. So do you have an electric car? No. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I trade yeah. my cars in like every 22 years. So yeah, right. <laughs> Next I, know, I didn't home. expect that. But I mean, the evidence of climate change is so much more obvious. And people are talking, but there, I mean, there's a group, there's always a group that denies it, but don't you really think it's becoming much more of a public discussion and a public concern? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, people are focused on it. The evidence of it is uh, inescapable. Um, the nightly weather is uh, uh, being led uh, more days per week now than ever in television history with uh, the terrible weather of the day and the, the week and all that and so forth. So it's hard to keep denying. Um, some places are doing better than others in addressing it. Um, you know, we started in uh, the first Kerry administration, um, getting rid of um, uh, fuel oil. Uh, we substituted natural gas. Natural gas is a carbon uh, source, but compared to the oil we substituted for, it was a step forward. We did away with coal um, and we put in all of the, what I used to call the hippie energy strategies that we promoted, which yeah. were um, solar, wind, small hydro up in the Adirondacks, uh, conservation in all its forms. And those uh, strategies are still the smartest and cheapest thing to do. Right. And uh, I think we need to uh, keep coming back to that. And I think We've just come out of four years of Washington denying everything but the sunrise every day. Uh, I think with a new president and a lot of committed governors, we can get back on track with doing something about climate change. We have to do something. I, I, I mean, I, I've never really studied it in, in any great detail and I'm not that totally familiar, but isn't the goal on both sides to make this country energy independent and didn't Trump see that as looking for more oil and keeping the mines open. But what you're suggesting is the opposite way of making us energy independent? Well, uh, his emphasis was on energy up out of the ground and that's oil, gas and coal. And all three of them are uh, contrary to smart climate policy. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean we can get there overnight. But he simply shut down all of these programs that started um, uh, really in earnest with Jimmy Carter, continued through uh, Jerry Ford, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, all the way through. Um, even and in, in New York, um, uh, we've had one Republican governor in the uh, last generation, George Pataki, and he had a pretty good record on uh, energy and climate change and so forth. So uh, it's not a partisan issue. Um, and uh, uh, the problem is the smaller strategies um, are uh, hard work and the tax policy isn't always consistent. But then you see an entrepreneur like uh, this fellow who did Tesla, uh, the, uh, Tesla cars and so forth. And um, uh, each of the companies at their own speed coming into uh, electric burning cars. But we have to remember uh, electric is not a, an energy source. It's a form of use. You have to still look at where's the energy coming from. So if you're driving a, a beautiful new Tesla that's fueled entirely from a coal plant, you really haven't really made much progress. So we have to do all these things at the same time. Mm. So explain to me though, are we dependent on other countries and what does that entail? Um, well, the energy independence discussion, I think rightly uh, was at its best when it talked about North America, Canada, the United States, and Mexico working commonly. And politics and international and all that stuff has gotten in the way of that uh, all too often. But um, the uh, capacity to manufacture, for example, um, uh, solar panels for rooftops mm -hmm. uh, in the form of solar voltaic energy or in the right location, solar hot water. Uh, is something we should be doing in the United States. Uh, the Chinese cornered the market on so much of the equipment for that and have built part of their economy on that. Uh, we should be doing more of that. Um, uh, this governor, uh, Governor Cuomo, has 
been out front on wind energy. Uh, I don't always agree with the locations. I don't like to see them from my beach, these windmills, but uh, uh, that kind of power up on the um, western slope of the Adirondacks in very remote areas has worked. It's worked in the desert in California. Uh, so all of those things are real and should be done. And to the extent we can uh, do all of the associated manufacturing that goes with these new forms, uh, we should try to do it here at home. There was a story today in the Times about a group that is, uh, is, work, is, is formed to increase or to start a project of installing solar panels on houses in poorer neighborhoods, lower income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. because also you would bring jobs to the community. Um, is that a chance maybe of being a national movement? I don't know, but it is well, a movement I, that's starting I think, in California, right? Yeah, well, I think the chances of it happening have grown. Um, I kid people, but in the early days when we, uh, I was the energy commissioner, um, we did a solar atlas of the state and uh, Nassau and Suffolk County came in first. We had more usable, particularly Suffolk, more uh, convertible solar days uh, for energy purposes than any other part of the state. Uh, sadly, Ithaca and Syracuse came in last and next to last. So it's a weather related idea. But uh, <clears throat> the um, Cuomo administration has had good incentives in place for going solar. And a lot of firms have popped up mm -hmm. um, to uh, do residential solar uh, and uh, either voltaic or hot water um, because we have a solar profile that allows it. Um, it's more difficult in larger buildings, uh, multifamily buildings, but you take a community like the MTA region, the suburban communities all around uh, uh, Manhattan, um, they could all uh, do a whole lot more with solar. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you get down to it, it's a question of the positioning of uh, the house and what's available and so forth. But I think we seeded that manufacturing base to China. And I think this new administration is committed to bringing that back, bringing it up as a domestic industry and relating that then to the markets that are out there. Uh, yeah. Not easy, but it's the right thing to do. When you talked about the windmills, I, I decided that that's uh, a nymphy instead of nimby because the, the argument is not in my front yard, but <laughs> are <laughs> there not? Right. <laughs> Has, have we done a study of where windmills could safely be installed in New York State? Uh, yeah, there has been a lot of uh, 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 looking at that. I, th I think the most uninhabited part of the western slope of the Adirondacks, the North Country. Mm -hmm. uh, I apologize to North folks, uh, North Country <laughs> folks, they hear this, but um, I think given their their size, remember these are four hundred foot towers with wingspans of, of at least that dimension, and they make noise. Uh, let's be clear about it. They make a hum at least and noise and so forth. So um, I think remote locations are important. I worry about the ocean because I'm, I've been a sailor all my life. I was in the, in the Navy. I've uh, crossed the ocean a few times, um, been on the beach my whole life. Um, the ocean is a tough environment the materials that go into these towers. We've mm -hmm. seen it over and over again in uh, the Gulf of Mexico with these platforms. We've seen it on the coast of uh, California. We've seen it in Europe. Um, a right location can be done, but um, safety and wear and tear uh, really have to be accounted for. And the problem with them when they fail, which they don't very often, but when they do, um, if they're out in the ocean, you've got uh, a problem. So uh, uh, location, 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 and the location has to be remote. The Keystone Pipeline, can you tell us about that? As it should with every energy discussion, let's talk about what form of energy and where it's coming from. And in this case, it is petroleum from tar sands. So that uh, is what you know of as uh, heavy oil and tar embedded in sand deep underground and particularly in Western Canada. 
they have developed uh, techniques um, for uh, reaching those deposits, um, uh, cleansing the sand from the, the oil product and getting it uh, fluid enough and, and um, uh, uh, liquid enough to travel through a pipeline and all the way down through the middle of the country, all the way down to Texas, uh, more or less. And um, there's been 25 years of controversy about it now. Um, a lot of that controversy in the US has to do with the routing of it, uh, the necessity for it or not. Uh, administrations have gone this way and that way. There have been court cases and so forth. Um, uh, Trump, the Trump administration uh, tried to bring it back to life. I think the Biden administration is trying to put it back to, to rest. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, take a more global view for Western Canada, this is an ugly process. Um, and I don't know what the subsidy uh, profile is in Canada, but in the US, uh, tax policy um, is very much in favor of all kinds of conventional drilling and oil and gas and um, so forth. Uh, fracking is the, was the big issue in New York for about 10 years um, till the market changed that. Um, so um, start that discussion with knowing whether uh, it makes sense for, as North Americans to see this part of Canada, um, uh, the surface of it being uh, so uh, uh, harshly affected by this tar sands uh, process. I think on that basis alone, I would uh, uh, be opposed to that pipeline because um, there might be better ways to do this. So what are you most interested in these days? Steinbeck Park. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I think we've come through the worst um, political, political science exercise of my lifetime. That was my college major. I've been in it most of my adult life, as you know, and you and I have worked together and uh, had a lot of fun with our careers. Um, but uh, I'm very concerned about the condition of our uh, public psyche these days. We have uh, assaulted and diminished uh, respect for political process to a very dangerous point. And um, for which I would offer January 6th as the living proof of what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. A relentless campaign of disinformation, absolute falsehood, um, demonization of conflicts that should be debated in the halls of Congress and in state houses and village halls have become personal, have become dirty. Uh, and uh, when you put that together with uh, what uh, President Obama described that possibly the worst decision the uh, modern Supreme Court has made, the Citizens United uh, decision, which allows unlimited, essentially obscured money to buy and own campaigns and therefore have outsized influence uh, in our government. Mm -hmm. And uh, you look at the filings and everything else. So the combination of this new cynical um, mindset, exploitive, um, ideological in some cases, in a lot of cases simply exploitive, in combination with um, vast unlimited amounts of money uh, thrown at, uh, uh, in behalf of some uh, candidates, but thrown against a lot of perfectly good office holders. And even though with this change of administrations, I don't see that changing yet. Uh, I think it's gonna be a long time uh, reintroducing respect for civics, for civil dialogue, all those things that um, worked more or less pretty well for us. Um, I'm a Vietnam era person. I got caught up in the war myself, but uh, uh, part of the era that uh, basically uh, the, com the country challenged public policy effectively. Uh, there were some bad actors in all of that, but uh, the country really had a conversation and debate um, during a period. I don't think we're capable of those kind of conversations anymore. It's, and we're it's so divided. So glad that you mentioned civics uh, because that's one of my, I don't know, it's 
it's the thing that reinforced my parents' attitude during the Roosevelt era because they, they understood the need for public, for the government to come in. And my civics teacher in junior high school really helped reinforce in us the civic role that a citizen has in how you have to participate and you have to understand that the concern for a community. Did you take civics in school? I had all of that and I was a poli sci major and then I became a lawyer and then I went to the Hill. Yeah. Um, so I've been in that process. I love it. Um, I don't like everything about it, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the number of people who tell you today they hate politics and politicians mm -hmm. is at a dangerous level. Um, most people drawn to public life are there for the right reasons and trying to do a good job. And um, we've made the vilification, uh, the denigration of all that a uh, commonplace in a lot of the country uh, and a lot of communities. Um, I can tell you right here in our beautiful little whaling village, uh, there are family members who don't talk to one another anymore after these last four years. Uh, that's how intense it has become. I don't understand how we allowed this to happen in the last four years. And I, it comes down, I guess, to the political, the office holders in, a, in, in an important way, because they go, they go along. Is their interest in being reelected more than their interest in sound public policy, do you think? In too many cases, absolutely. And people what talk- brought about, about, What brought that about, do you think? Well, I think a steady diet of one of the most effective and manipulative uh, modern uh, media savvy office holders, Donald Trump, has a lot to do okay. with it. Yeah. Uh, he got to a point um, uh, through um, uh, traditional media and through social media where he developed a, an almost, a, almost a cult of supporters throughout the country who would believe anything he said and would do anything he asked them to do and uh, put their money where he said. And office holders, particularly since Citizens United, uh, are terrified uh, about money. And so when they see a president who uh, uh, can uh, uh, bang them on television and see their numbers and their money dry up overnight, uh, and then a couple of outfits, very heavily funded by the Mercers and some of these other families, the Cokes, uh, explicitly saying, do this or we're gonna send uh, someone into your district to primary you. So Republicans in fear of being primaried have become the dominant force in the Republican party. Totally. It's shameful, but it's understandable given the way politics has yeah. evolved and it's but terrible. Trump won, a, he won a primary. <laughs> And he won because people thought that he was rich and people thought, you know, that he was very successful and all of that. So is that talk to a, a basic interest on the part of the public? I mean, it's a complicated question. And the minute, uh, even what I just said will offend some people. Um, but um, when you have the platform and are as skillful and in my judgment, unprincipled, as Donald Trump, but believable and um, charismatic in a perverse sort of way, you can sell anything. Mm -hmm. And most of his career has been selling bankers on right. giving him money yeah. and, and governments on letting him build things. And he converted that. Let's understand he's never had a majority approval rating right. in his time in office. And he did not win either election uh, but the one that put him in the White House, uh, he lost the popular vote there by six or seven million votes. So um, these kind of anomaly, uh, anomaly, uh, anomalies can occur when uh, someone is shrewd enough and unprincipled enough to command the media and then use it to sell basically, a, a, you know, a tall story, which is mm -hmm. what I think happened. And I, I'm hoping that... Um, uh, the triumph of a better man, a flawed man, but a better man who plays it a whole lot straighter than the guy he succeeded. And with a substantial majority of the popular vote and the electoral mm -hmm. vote will set the tone. I think a president can set a tone. 
Yeah. And I think in his first month or so now, uh, uh, Joe Biden is setting a new tone, civility, thoughtfulness. Um, he hasn't vilified Empathy, anybody. empathy too, right? Empathy for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a reason to be, I, I hope, hopeful. I'm glad we've reconnected after these few years. We haven't seen each other. Um, and by all means, call me anytime. Good luck with the park and the uh, house. Thanks, Thank you honey. very much, and Jim LaRocca. Hope to see you in real life very soon. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.